This video is sponsored by Denial. Hello and welcome to Making Film, a series where we take a look at everything from the construction of films to film history and how cinema affects how we see the world. Today we take a look at how cinema shapes our understanding of an historical event, in this case, the Holocaust. How do you approach a film related to the Holocaust? How can you even begin to approach a subject so incomprehensibly horrific? So I got an email a little while ago asking if I would be interested in making a sponsored video on the subject of the Holocaust in film, to help promote the UK DVD release of Denial, starring Rachel Weisz, Tom Wilkinson, and Timothy Spall. The film follows the true story in which Holocaust scholar Deborah Lipstadt was sued by Holocaust denier David Irving for libel. The idea got me thinking about how filmmakers approach the depiction of such an extreme historical event like the Holocaust and how this shapes our understanding of history. Now, the Nazi genocide of the Jewish people and other groups in Europe during the 1940s is a sensitive subject to tackle. That said, the Holocaust, or Shoah, has been portrayed directly or indirectly in a wide variety of genres, including drama, documentary, horror, action, and even comedy. There is an inherent acceptance that horror, action, and comedy are using the setting and the hatred toward Nazis for storytelling and are not necessarily making an attempt to recreate an authentic portrayal of the Holocaust, whereas drama and documentary are. So let's take a look at how they do that. In denial, Holocaust denier David Irving attempts to put the Holocaust on trial through his libel suit against Deborah Lipstadt, but it is he, and Holocaust denial in general, who is put on trial. There was a risk that by fighting the libel suit in court and losing, it would be accepted that there are two equal points of view. That some people believe that the Holocaust happened the way we understand it, and some do not. As we've seen in other areas, allowing a denialist point of view can stagnate progress or undermine an issue altogether. In order to combat this with the depiction of the Holocaust in drama and documentary, Aaron Kerner notes a list of guidelines for making a Holocaust film by Terence DePress in Kerner's book, Film and the Holocaust new perspectives. First, the Holocaust shall be represented in its tonality as a unique event, as a special case and kingdom of its own, above or below or apart from history. We see a lot of dramas that deal directly with the Holocaust categorized as Holocaust films rather than historical dramas or war films like those depicting most other historical events. Second, representations of the Holocaust shall be as accurate and faithful as possible to the facts and conditions of the event, without change or manipulation for any reason artistic reasons included. And third, the Holocaust shall be approached as a solemn or even a sacred event, with a seriousness admitting no response that might obscure its enormity or dishonor its dead. When we think of Holocaust films, we usually think of those that take place inside the camps, and when we think of authenticity in the depiction of the Holocaust, we tend to think of documentary. Documentaries provide visual evidence of the result of the atrocities, photographs that we can see with our own eyes. But whose eyes are we seeing with? In a documentary titled Night and Fog by Alain René, much of the archival footage we see was filmed by the Nazis themselves, which gives the audience a unique gaze from the point of view of the perpetrators. The archival footage is also intercut with the footage of the camps taken decades after the war has ended. Despite harrowing images such as piles of eyeglasses and scratch marks in the shower rooms, Elizabeth Cowie notes that these images fail as visible evidence, without the explanation provided by the narrator. And in Claude Landsman's documentary Shoah, the testimony relies almost entirely on the words of those who experienced the Holocaust, which in a way forces us to see the events they depict through our own mind's eye. In 1945, a British documentary eventually titled Memory of the Camps was made that aimed to show the result of German atrocities in the newly liberated concentration camps. The film, often wrongfully attributed to Alfred Hitchcock, was made by Hitchcock's friend Sidney Bernstein and remained uncompleted until February 1984. During the months following Germany's defeat, Russia had been releasing newsreel footage of liberated camps and were preparing their own documentaries. This prompted Bernstein to have his producer, Sergei Noldbendov, to begin going through footage from Russian newsreels, the US Army Pictorial Service, War Office, RAF, and the British newsreel companies in order to collect every piece of available footage showing the atrocities committed by the Nazis. The goal was to compile evidence of these atrocities from all around the world, to be screened to audiences in formerly Nazi-occupied territories who, quote, had been exposed during the preceding four or five years to Nazi propaganda. It was after a visit to Belsen that Bernstein decided to pivot the film from being a, quote, retrospective compilation to a full documentary with new and archived footage that would be definitive evidence to quell any possibility for denial that these events took place. Bernstein would have the cameraman document not only the bodies of the dead, 
the testimony of the survivors and German prisoners, but the company logos and nameplates of the German and foreign companies who contributed resources and construction to this systematic extermination. The objective now was to make a version of the documentary for German citizens and prisoners to show the evil acts that the National Socialist Party committed, quote, in their name, as a way to prevent any potential terrorist acts by German citizens in the name of the party. The film was also meant to implicate the German audience as complicit in these crimes. Most of the German people, including POWs, refused to accept any responsibility for what happened. Many had likened the disturbing images of the camps to the constant publishing of photos in national newspapers of dead Germans due to Allied bombings. They managed to separate themselves from what they were seeing in the footage of the camps as merely the government's doing. We can see something similar in David Irving in Denial. Even when confronted by video evidence of very racist things he has said, he still doesn't consider himself to be a racist. You sued because you said that we had called you a racist and an extremist. Yes. But I'm not a racist. While the film footage taken during the liberation of the camps offers us a more objective view of the aftermath of the atrocities, what is missing are the atrocities themselves. This is where dramatic narrative comes in. Most of what's depicted in these films is based on witness testimony. Perhaps the most famous filmic narrative depiction of the Holocaust is Steven Spielberg's 1993 drama Schindler's List, in which a German factory owner uses his status and resources to save many Jewish lives during World War II. Spielberg's approach was to use an induced documentary style, similar to William Friedkin's depiction of the events in The French Connection. Many, many scenes were handheld and, and not planned. I didn't plan shots. I didn't sit home at night making shot lists or doing storyboards as I usually do. And then I would just wander into the scene like I was an eavesdropper with the camera to try to make the existence of the camera very second nature to what was happening in front of the camera. Of course, quite a lot of documentaries contain handheld footage out of necessity. Documentary filmmakers often capture events as they unfold, without the opportunity for planned camera moves and framing that fictional narratives can afford. Spielberg would take a similar approach with Saving Private Ryan, which, like Schindler's List, also enlisted the talents of cinematographer Janusz Kaminski. The handheld shots, coupled with the use of black and white, make Schindler's List appear, at times, disturbingly close to real life captured in a documentary. In his book, Kerner speaks about the feminization of Jewish victims in Holocaust films, and notes that there's often a sex crime aspect. In Schindler's List, we see this not only in Amon Get choosing Helen Hirsch as his housekeeper, but also in the scenes with nude females being sent to what could have been the gas chambers. We see this in Denial as well. Irving goes after Lipstadt, a Jewish woman who in the courtroom is forced by her own defense to remain passive while the war is fought in front of her. Despite her efforts to defend herself, it is made clear that the only way she can win the case is if the men win it on her behalf. In Holocaust dramas, the Jewish internees lack any ability to protect themselves and can only hope to miraculously survive what often appears as random murder. They require the capable allied soldiers to save them. This utter impotence to have any control over your situation with each moment potentially being your last is what makes Holocaust films far more disturbing than any other. Holocaust dramas and documentaries aim to inform and create an understanding of the events that took place. Schindler's List brought the testimonies of the survivors to the world's attention. The film was, quote, seen by a quarter of the population of Britain and nearly a third of the population of Germany. But what about other genres? One could argue that films like Schindler's List or The Pianist are horror films. A connection is drawn between Holocaust films and slasher flicks, with the Jewish people as the terrorized females and the Nazis as the unstoppable killer possessing superhuman strength and lacking any remorse. Something like Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards purposefully subverts this structure and depicts a group of Jewish American soldiers terrorizing and brutalizing the Nazis. Here we get a cathartic answer to the absolute hopelessness of reality and are allowed to experience a fantasy of justice. You thought that there was a profound revenge for Hitler's crimes in making fun of him, that in a way surpasses everything. It seems strange to think of a Holocaust comedy, but they do exist. My name is Adolf. I'm on the mic. I'm going to hip you to the story of the new third right. There are plenty of comedies that revolve around Nazis, whether it be to make fun or to shock an audience. Heil Hitler! Heil myself. But there is even comedy in films depicting the genocide. Perhaps the most famous is Roberto Benigni's Life is Beautiful, where a man tricks his young son into thinking what is going on in the camps is part of a game. 
Scusate se vado di fretta, ma oggi sto giocando a nascondino. Ora vado, se no mi fanno tana. But there's also an interesting film called Genghis Khan, where a Jewish comedian is executed in a concentration camp and comes back as a ghost to haunt a former Nazi in 1958. It is possible that horror, action, and comedy allow us to explore the Holocaust in a more real way by requiring our participation through fear, suspense, and laughter, and therefore we cope from within as opposed to experiencing an outsider's view based on pity. A major theme that denial brings up is the silencing of the Jewish voice. Denial of the Holocaust requires ignoring the testimony of those who experienced it. Lipstadt is recommended by her counsel not to speak during the trial, nor allow any of the Holocaust survivors to testify. This disregards the first-person perspective of the average victim. I believe this speaks to Holocaust films in general. Whereas many Holocaust films are built out of witness testimony, Kerner writes that, as victim, Jewish characters lack agency, and narratives get played through or around them as opposed to by them. We get a voyeuristic view of the brutality inflicted on the victims from an outside perspective. This is more or less prevalent in Schindler's List, which revolves around Oskar Schindler, a Gentile German businessman, as he transforms from complicit in what's happening to the Jews to a kind of savior for the victims. Even a film like The Pianist revolves around Spielmann's attempt at survival among the backdrop of Jewish suffering. What he witnesses outweighs what is inflicted upon him. Spielmann's musical talent seems to almost lift him to a higher level than the other victims, as if to say that Spielmann is special and shouldn't be forced to die like the average people. Of course, it would be ridiculous to think that this is in any way intended in these films, but I would argue that a better example of Jewish agency outside of action films like Inglorious Bastards and Defiance is in Life is Beautiful. It is unique for a Holocaust film that takes place in the camps to have the quest of survival be secondary to a different objective. In this case, Guido is trying to keep his young son from discovering the horror of their situation by making a game out of it. Similarly, Son of Saul follows a Jewish man forced to work the gas chambers who tries to give a boy believed to be his son a proper Jewish burial. Roberto Benini, who co-wrote, directed, and starred in Life is Beautiful, is not Jewish himself despite playing a Jewish man in the film. Seeing as the vast majority of the victims of the Holocaust were murdered for being Jewish, the story of the Holocaust is regarded as a Jewish story. However, is a Jewish heritage required of an author to tell these stories? Often, there is a certain authority perceived in a Jewish filmmaker making a Holocaust film. Roman Polanski, who directed The Pianist, is a survivor himself. Uh, then they were liquidating the parts of ghetto. They had lists of people and they would come at night to take people away. Steven Spielberg doesn't have a connection to the Holocaust in his immediate family, but he speaks on wanting to make Schindler's List because he is Jewish. I'm not the son of a survivor. I'm certainly related to survivors and victims of the Holocaust through my grandparents with all the relatives they lost. It is argued that critics and scholars tend to impart ownership of the Holocaust to Jewish filmmakers, likely because it's perceived that a Jewish person would be more inclined to use proper care and respect when approaching an event that is so closely tied to their ancestors and heritage. Well, I tried to get Marty Scorsese in the mid-80s to do Schindler's List, and he felt that he couldn't do it because he wasn't Jewish. Really? Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about the David Irving trial being against a Jewish person. Lipsat becomes not just a defendant, not just arguing against Holocaust denial, but a symbol for Jewish people taking ownership of their own history. The thing that pretty much all of the mainstream Holocaust-related films have in common is the depiction of good versus evil. Obviously, there is no question that the Nazis were evil, but these films allow us to position ourselves comfortably on the side of good without taking into account that the rise of the Nazis was a failure of humanity. It is hard to wrap your head around the idea that under the right circumstances, you or I could possibly have been complicit in something so inhuman. A similar theme is depicted in a film titled The Grey Zone, in which the Jewish internees help the Nazis exterminate their people in exchange for their own lives. Denial shows his antagonist, David Irving, as human. He is depicted as a loving father who enjoys playing with his child, and he is even a gracious loser. What's important to the portrayal of Irving is that he is seen, in part, through his own eyes. Irving sees himself as a logical thinker, someone who is uncovering a conspiracy that heavily benefits the conspirators. He represents himself in the trial, making him the David to Lipstadt's legal team's Goliath. And he sees himself as a scholar whose work, person, and legacy is the target of an attack by those who can't prove their words. Portraying Irving in this way as opposed to simply a villain allows we the audience to better understand how a denier is created. There is infinitely more that can be said on the subject of the Holocaust in film, but I hope you found the subject to be as thought-provoking as I have. 
And be sure to check out Denial coming to DVD in the UK on June 5th. Thanks for watching.